Okay, Kelly, let's get started. I think it's good to start this time. Wait, yeah, sure, okay. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kelly Tori, and I'm hosting uh, this morning's seminar series. It is uh, February 4th, 2022. And uh, today we have speaking for us, uh, Thomas Ratoli, who is filling in for uh, Sandra Snevorsdottir uh, from CarbFix. So Thomas is located in Iceland currently, so he's, uh, um, doing us a great favor by doing a presentation for what is him on a, a Friday afternoon, late in the afternoon. Um, as a reminder, before we get things started, everybody, uh, first of all, again, of course, please no questions until the end. Uh, at, at that point, we can ask the questions in chat or, or if you would like to unmute. Um, but again, let's hold everything till the end. And for those of you who won't make it through all the way to the end, a reminder that next week, February 11th, our speaker will be Swapen Sahu uh, from Equinor, and he'll be giving a talk on uh, geochemistry and his work that he's been doing in, in critical minerals recently. So, okay, uh, let's get on to about Thomas. <clears throat> so Thomas is the head of reservoir engineering at CarbFix, and he has over 10 years experience in modeling subsurface processes in the geothermal energy and CO2 sequestration space. Thomas completed his master's in reservoir engineering from the Superior University of Geology in Nancy, France. And after working for a year in Paris for an engineering company specializing in the development of district heating capabilities in the Paris area, he moved to New Zealand to complete a Master of Energy at the University of Auckland in 2012. And Thomas has been a part of the CarbFix team since 2018, and he's been overseeing the reservoir modeling of uh, the, the CarbFix flagship injection project at the Helishaidi, uh, Southwest Iceland. He's further interested in the validation and certification of geological storage of CO2. And again, thank you, Thomas, for, for uh, stepping in for Sandra today. If you'd like to take it away, we are excited to see your work. Well, thanks a lot, Kelly, for this uh, great uh, introduction. So I'm just going to share my screen to let me know if you can, uh, if you can see it. Yes, everything looks yeah. great. All right, fantastic. So, um, as Kelly said, so I have a few slides, about half an hour, 35 minutes presentation that's kind of go, going to go over uh, who we are at CarbFix and what we do, what's our story, and what, what we're interested in. So, um, so let's jump right in. Second, yes, so if we look at the broad perspective when it comes to climate action and limiting the temperature increase on our planet to well below two degrees, we have a huge task in front of us. So we need to avoid overall over a thousand billion tons of CO2 emission in the next 40 years. And as part of that, CCS, carbon capture and storage, needs to provide over 10% of the um, energy uh, emission reduction required by 2060. And so that's kind of a well-known fact that our climate goals won't be reached without uh, widespread use of, of CCS. And this is where kind of CarbFix comes in. CarbFix, we are one of the uh, solution provider in the CCS um, world, and we offer an economic and environmentally friendly way to permanently transform captured CO2 to stone underground. So as part of the CCS full chain, we're at the, at, the, at the end of it, where we can accept the various type of CO2 to sequester underground. But I'll, I'll go a bit more in details uh, in the next few slides. So in just a few words, so what do we do at CarbFix? So at Car CarbFix, we capture CO2 and turn it to stone underground in less than two years through a technology that uh, imitates and accelerates a process that nature has applied over millions of years to regulate the long-term CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So the piece of rock sample that you can see here on the slide on the right is a basalt. And it's actually one of the most common rock um, on earth. We find it on every uh, con continent. And embedded in the pores, so in the little holes of the, um, of the uh, piece of rock, you can see some white crystals. And these are carbonate minerals that contain solidified CO2. And um, using the CarbFix technology, we transform the capture of CO2 permanently into stone in just under two years by transforming it into those carbonate minerals. 
because if you're probably aware, it's not only in trees and vegetation that, uh, that can store a carbon. There's also huge quantities that are naturally stored in rocks. And over 99% of the carbon on earth is actually already stored in underground. So the, the earth crust naturally stores over 200,000 times more carbon than the ocean, atmosphere, plants, and soil combined. Combined. So what we did is we figured out a way to speed up that process using science and innovation so that by using our technologies, CO2 can be transformed into stone in a very short amount of time instead of the process taking hundreds of thousands of years. So who are we? So Carbfix is a subsidiary of Reykjavik Energy and Reykjavik Energy is uh, the largest geothermal energy company in Iceland. And Reykjavik Energy connects about 70% of the population of Iceland to the geothermal uh, resources. And we have one, our main flagship project is operated from the Heti Shady Geothermal Power Plant, which is the one that is in picture here, which has been the testbed and laboratory of Carbfix from its start. And what we do there is actually we capture the um, emissions of the geothermal power plant directly and we inject it into the subsurface for, for storage. Because even though 99.5% of the emission of the power station is just water, there is still a little bit of CO2 and H2S that is being emitted from the power station. And this amounts to approximately 36,000 tons of, of CO2 every year, which is substantial, but still kind of reasonably small compared to other um, energy uh, provider. So the, the Hickey Shady geothermal power plant is uh, actually the largest in Iceland and it produces 300 megawatts of electricity and 200 megawatt of uh, thermal power. And currently we capture a third of the CO2 emission and nearly all of the H2S emissions. So how did the Carpix start? So Carpix started out in 2007 as a collaborative research project between the industry and academia in Iceland, Europe, and the US. So it was it was a research project that had Reykjavik Energy, the University of Iceland, Columbia University in the US, and CNRS, which is a research lab in France. And in seven years, uh, we transformed an idea on paper, which is storing CO2 in basalt, to a proven industrial scale technology, which can allow us to fight climate change by, by um, getting rid of the excess CO2. So this technology is based on firm scientific foundation, uh, with over 100 peer-reviewed uh, papers that have been published, and it is a sharing of information that we still continue up to this day. And so here in this kind of a timeline, you can see uh, you can see the highlights and the main development phases that we've gone through along with some of the major um, milestones. So from about 2007 to uh, 2018, Carfix was a research project, and then in 2000. 1819, uh, Carfix, the company was established. And since then, over the past few years, we've scaled up and optimized our capture and injection operation. And we've also kind of further increased our understanding of the subsurface process and continued development of the technology. And so what is Carfix? So Carfix is based on a, on a relatively simple process, just favorable chemistry. And what we do is we simply mix water with CO2 and inject it into the ground where it starts to, uh, to mineralize. So what actually happens is when you have basalts or other reactive rock formations, such so as volcanic rock, they contain a lot of uh, metals. They contain a lot of those cations, calcium, magnesium, iron. And when you, when you put them in contact with CO2 that's been dissolved in water, they start to react and those metals get leached into, into the solution. And then in the subs subsequent step, the CO2 that's been dissolved in water will bind those metals to form carbonate minerals, such as uh, calcite. And this is basically what is happening underground if we, when we inject CO2 into uh, favorable rock formations. So this uh, little schematic just presents how the Carpex technology is currently uh, being applied at the Heti Shady power plant where Carpex was, uh, was developed. 
So basically there, the power plant emission is taken through a water scrubbing tower where the CO2 dissolve um, in a shower of water under pressure. And this is kind of a, you can think of it of an oversized soda maker machine. We, we make carbonated water. Then we transport that carbonated water into our injection site where we inject it into the ground in a basaltic reservoir. And there, in just a few years, actually under than two years, it uh, mineralizes to form uh, stable carbonate minerals. So this uh, technology can be adapted to harder to evade sectors, just steel, um, cement, metal production, and it's not linked with geothermal. It can work with any type of, um, of emission source, as long as you have the right, um, as long as you have favorable formation, this basaltic rock. So at uh, Heki Shady, we've uh, currently been injecting since 2014, and we've uh, just reached about 100,000 ton of, uh, of CO2 in its shred that has been injected and mineralized in our, in our reservoir. At uh, this site, the overall cost of the CCH change is about $25 per ton. So it's it's very competitive um, uh, system. I think just yesterday, the uh, the price of carbon on, on the European ETS market just reached 93 um, a euro. So it's, it's significantly uh, cheaper. Uh, so, we can adapt this technology to, um, to work with different um, source of CO2. So there's two main ways you, you can do it. Either you um, capture it directly from impure streams. So from uh, point source emitters, it could be power station, could be cement, steel. And you just, um, as we were doing it at Hetty Shady, you just capture the emission in a water scrubbing tower and then you inject it. A second option is that we can also accept CO2 from a third party tech um, uh, company. So we can work with their air capture and they provide us with the CO2 and we then uh, mix the CO2 with water inside a well and then we, uh, we uh, in inject it into the basalt for mineralization. So it it's a very kind of flexible uh, approach. So this is just a little picture um, that was taken by a colleague of mine that shows a bit our operation at the Hetty Shady. So this is a view from a drone and this building is the, uh, is the power station. And what do we do? So we capture the emission of the power station from the capture plant, which is this small building here. So it's actually a very small footprint. Then we have a small underground pipeline that um, transport the CO2 that is dissolved in water to our injection wells. And we're actually using currently two injection wells. And we inject it in our reservoir, which is at depth that are between uh, one and three kilometers depth, which is in that uh, entire area. And we kind of verify the process using our monitoring wells, which are located um, further along the, the, the path. And so this is kind of the, the, the end result is that the CO2 will be permanently stored in forms of carb carbonate minerals in the, uh, the reservoir. So as I kind of explained on the first slide, all of those small dots. So how do we make sure that uh, what we inject is first not escaping and that it actually mineralizes? Well, we do it by uh, first off to make sure it's not escaping by making sure that the CO2 stay dissolved when we inject it. And we can just do that by making sure that the pressure in our injection well is sufficient to, uh, to keep the CO2 in, in solution. Now to uh, prove the mineralization, what do we do? We, we usually inject at the same time as we inject the CO2 uh, reactive or an unreactive tracer. And a tracer is uh, a molecule that will not react that with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the rock. And so if we use unreactive tracer, we'll be able to compare um, how much of the tracer you're getting back in the mineral wells with how much CO2 you're getting back. And if you do the difference between the two, that is the amount that is being lost um, in, in the reservoir. So this is the amount that is uh, being mineralized. 
And so this is something that we've been working uh, quite a lot the past few months and years is, is kind of working that monitoring and verification of the process. So we're working with, uh, with different uh, standard setting bodies, such as DNV or we're in the CCS initiative, where we are kind of making the requirements and, and participating in building the, uh, the methodologies that are needed to have a robust and transparent uh, greenhouse gas accounting because we want to make sure that uh, that we're re what we're injecting in the subsurface is being permanently stored and there's no not any risk of it, uh, of it leaking. And so then we can issue either carbon credits or we can be on the compliance market depending where we, where we are. So now I just want to talk about a few projects that, that we're currently having. Um, so actually right before the COP26, we uh, signed with uh, the uh, European Union uh, a new grant as part of the Innovation Fund where we're going to be uh, upscaling our operation at the Hetli Shevi Geothermal Power Station. So we're going to capture a new, uh, we're going to construct a new capture plant which will bring the operation to full scale. And we'll be capturing 95% of the emission of the power plant, as opposed to a third uh, now. And so this will represent about 34,000 tons of CO2 and 12,000 tons of H2S uh, per year. So this is something that we're, we're quite excited. We'll be able to, uh, to have one of the first carbon neutral geothermal power station uh, in the world. And this project will be operation in 2025. Uh, we've also um, partnered up with Planworks who is a direct air capture provider at, uh, at, uh, in Iceland, where they capture the CO2 directly from the atmosphere, then they give it to us, and we inject it in our reservoir, and we uh, transform it to stone. So we, we developed with them the first commercial DAC and the storage chain in, in the world, something that we're very, very excited about, something that we see for quite, quite a bit of a good press, and it's, uh, it, is, it is exciting. Now, just to look a bit more at the at the uh, broader scale. So, where does CarbFix work? Because CarbFix is not just limited to to Iceland. So, the potential for applying CO two mineral storage in Basel around the globe is is huge, and it's far greater than what is ever needed for climate action. And that is because Basel is very common uh, on on Earth, and so we've actually built. Um, a Carpix atlas that shows the favorable rock formations and shows the uh, point source emitters, so you can see where potentially Carpix could be uh, could be applied. And so we're working to, um, to kind of share that knowledge and to export the Carpix method abroad. That it is kind of a very key in in our in our kind of business model. And so we're working on the scaling up application of the Carpix technology through actually three different. Uh, three power pathways depending on how the CO2 is sourced because it's always the trick how do you get the CO2 uh, to the storage formations. And I think I've got a, a slide on that a bit later on. But so um, for example if we look a bit more uh, of actual numbers so Basel in Europe could store at least 4,000 billion tons of CO2. So this is huge amount, much more than what is kind of needed for climate change. And in Iceland enough, we could store about 100 times the amount we need to capture and inject until 2060. So mineral source storage does offer a vast storage potential and unlock regions in the world where CCS has until not been considered uh, possible because we, we do not rely on, on the same things, but I'm gonna slide about that just after. So one of the questions is why is CO2 mineral storage? It's because we, we have a few key uh, advantages that, um, that work for us. So this is basically a small summary of these uh, um, advantages. So first off, it's natural. So we're just imitating um, a natural process. We don't use any chemicals. We don't use um, different things. So we do have a very kind of clean and green image. It's also relatively low cost because uh, we rely on a network of shallow wells. So we don't need to drill very deep wells. We don't need to drill really hot wells. We, we are kind of, we have a, a low upfront cost uh, on it when you compare it to other more traditional uh, CCS um, uh, technologies. 
were also safe. And that is because the leakage is eliminated with the uh, instant solubility trapping underground. And that's because we dissolve the CO2 in water. So it becomes denser and has no drive to go back up to the surface. The other one is that it's permanent because then as I kind of showed, the CO2 that's dissolved in water will react with the host rock and will form carbonate minerals that are, that are stable for millennia. And it's also, it's a very fast process. So you don't really have any need for any long-term monitoring as long as you, you've showed that it has mineralized. It is innovative with, uh, as I said, from scientific background. And when you look at the broader scale on Earth, it's almost unlimited. The storage capacity is much great, greater than what is needed for climate goals. So CARPEX is part of the CCS world, which is the carbon capture and storage world. And, and we, we have a, a few like kind of cost saving by, by using CARPEX technology uh, compared to, uh, to traditional CCS is first off, we or we can do onshore ejection with no problem. We have a, that modular scale up through a network of shallow wells. As you can see here, we, we don't need, we don't rely on one big well, deep well. We, we rely on, on a network. So it's a bit more flexible uh, buildup. And if a well fails, then you just drill another one. There's a bit less risk uh, linked to that. We can also um, inject impure CO2, which saves on capture cost. And this is, we can, we've been injecting H2S, for example, and this works great, but we can also uh, inject some other traces uh, gases. And as I kind of said, there's a, we, in, in mineral storage, we don't rely on a cap rock, which is kind of key to, uh, to trap this, the, the CO2 that's otherwise uh, injected in gaseous or supercritical form. So the site characterization is a bit, uh, bit simplified. We, we, don't need, uh, we don't rely on the same type of, uh, of tools. And again, I'm not gonna repeat myself, but once you've uh, proved mineralization, long-term uh, monitoring is not required because it is there to stay. I just said CarbFix, we do have a, a very clear mission going forward for the next, uh, next 10 years, 10 to 15 years. So we, we wish to be a key instrument to tackle the climate crisis and substantially reduce global CO2 emission. And we have the, game, the aim to um, have a 1% share in the carbon storage market in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So that's about one gigaton uh, by 2030, which is that 1% of the 100,000, uh, 100, uh, um, gigaton that is required for, for CCS. So we're already working on new projects in several countries within and beyond the geothermal sector. And, and uh, just to repeat myself, our goal is to bring CarPix technology to the gigaton scale uh, by 2030. We do have a huge task uh, in front of us, but it's something that, uh, that uh, we're very excited about. So as I said in a few slides ago, uh, we're working on three different parallel pathways to reach that gigaton scale. And those pathways depend on the, on the way you're gonna capture and transport the, the CO2 to, to the storage reservoir. So the first one, which is on-site capture and, and storage. And this is what we've been doing at the Hetty Shady Geothermal Power Station. And this uh, targets power plant and hard to abate industries. And you can apply this where you have point source emitters that are located uh, near favorable storage location. So what you're gonna do, you're just gonna capture the CO2 from the emission stream and inject it on site into the bedrock for permanent storage. So the benefit of this uh, method is that it's the most efficient way to capture the CO2 because it's from a concentrated stream. The second option is the transport to mineral storage. And that is if you don't have favorable storage uh, location next to uh, the point source emitters. So there you would capture the CO2 from emission points, liquefy it, transport it into a hub, and then inject the CO2 to that hub that has a favorable rock formation. So the benefits of this uh, method is that you still rely on a very efficient capturing method and you become independent from the point source uh, emitters because you will create those hubs where there's favorable rock, uh, rock formation. Those hubs can be located anywhere where favorable rocks are found. 
And the third one is um, what we've already started doing with our friend from Climeworks is to capture directly from the atmosphere. So there you can capture it anywhere in the world where there's a uh, favorable rock formation and access to, to energy. So it can be located anywhere in the world. And there has been this in the, in the US, uh, some strong interest there with the X prize. Uh, it, it is a process that with, uh, with uh, partner with a few DAC provider and we are, we're part of that competition. So we'll see where that leads us. And now to, to go back to uh, what is gonna be our biggest uh, project in the, uh, in the next few years, it's the uh, Kodak terminal. And uh, the Kodak terminal, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be importing the CO2 that has been captured uh, from Europe by ship. But then we're gonna be uh, dissolving into water and injecting into uh, a storage site in Iceland. And so this is a project that uh, we are uh, currently uh, preparing and it actually uh, started. We're gonna start drilling for it in uh, this year, in 2022, to characterize the reservoir. And the plan is to be become operational by 2025, where we'll start by injecting 300,000 tons of CO2 per year. The plan is then to uh, reach one megaton per year by 2027 to reach uh, 3 million tons of CO2 per year after 2030. And so the idea for now is to, yeah, to bring the CO2 from the North, North Europe because currently it's kind of the, the, cheap, the cheapest uh, uh, option possible, the least uh, distance you need to transport it. Um, so if you look at kind of the, the, oh, the value chain and the cost, so first, yeah, you need to capture the CO2. So there we will partner with uh, partner up with other uh, capturing companies. We won't really be uh, uh, linked with that. But what we're gonna focus on with the quarter terminal is the transport and the, uh, and the injection and your storage. So as you can see the, the cost, most of the costs come from the transports between 20 euro to 50 euro per ton uh, for the, uh, Storage part, it's actually a lot cheaper. It starts at 15 euro per ton. This is uh, for the 300,000 ton case. And it's that amount will drop as, as the capacity of Coda will increase. But overall, it is still very uh, competitive. It's about 65 uh, euro per ton of CO2. So it's already lower than the, uh, than the price of carbon is being traded in Europe. So here, I just want to, yeah, to kind of go back to what, what we've currently done and where we're, where we're headed. So at Carfix, we developed our technology at the Hetty Shady Jotmal Power Station here in Iceland, where it, everything was a bit easier to, to, uh, to start Carfix. That's because we have very favorable rocks there. We have very fresh basalts. We also have access to a reasonably uh, clean energy we've got access to water, and we've got access to CO2. Uh, here on the left, that is our injection site. This is where we're currently injecting CO2. And here on the right is our capture plant. And here is the, uh, the, the DAC uh, capturing unit that, uh, that is currently in, in operation. So in addition to scaling up our project, we are also focusing on, on uh, furthering, uh, on further continuing innovation to, uh, to make the Carfix technology applicable to even more diverse locations than demonstrated uh, today. So one of our main uh, R&D focus currently is to, uh, to demonstrate the feasibility of using seawater to dissolve CO2. And this is gonna be quite key because this will, will unlock new areas where, um, where CO2 mineral storage is otherwise not possible, which could be offshore, or it could be in a water stressed area or in coastal areas. So using seawater has actually been proven um, on, uh, on paper in the lab, but we've yet to prove it on the field. And this is what we're gonna be doing in the summer, the upcoming summer, summer 2022, where we're gonna be using seawater uh, to dissolve CO2 and do a pilot injection. So we're going to be injecting a small amount of CO2 just to, to make sure that, um, that it mineralizes uh, correctly. 
What we're also focusing on is uh, to, uh, to test the potential of uh, mineral storage to other geologic formation other than basalt. So we're also looking at uh, more silicic formation to, uh, to, to work. So these has been proven on the, uh, in the lab, uh, not yet on the field, but as part of another European Union project, GECO, uh, injection will start this year in other formation. It's gonna start in uh, Turkey, as well as in uh, Germany. So it, even though we kind of have a metric technology, we're always kind of uh, uh, wanting to push the, the boundaries of it. So what, what do we kind of do some of our activities? We kind of offer consulting work and pilot preparations. And this, this has become a big part of, of what we, we offer. And so what do we do is we, we go in the field, we collect samples, we uh, do some experiments on them to assess the, the potential or the suitability of that uh, formation for mineral storage. And then we go to the next stage, which is the pilot injection. So these rocks were actually taken on the left from a, a site in France, and we we're gonna look at the, at the uh, reactivity of those rocks. And this is same rock from the same place where we're gonna assess the, uh, the uh, porosity and the permeability of this, uh, this rock type. But so here it's just a, a map that shows where we have, um, where we have ongoing op operation and uh, where we have some uh, projects so we, we have project in, in most continents. And this kind of shows kind of the ever, ever increasing interest uh, that people have in, in mineral storage. So um, our influence has started to, we we're starting to get known and our, our kind of, our plan is to kind of sustainably build a global conflict ecosystem with, uh, with kind of the help of local experts operators, et cetera. It's not something that, that Carpex will be able to do on our own. So we'll always need to partner up with the experts there. Um, and this is, yeah, just uh, to finish off, uh, just a few slides about how we kind of foresee the, the future. So there's quite a lot in this slide. I'm not gonna go through it all, but this is kind of how we see the, uh, how we're gonna reach the gigaton scale by, by 2030. So first, Below, we have our kind of R&D and flagship projects. You can have a, make sure that we, we, we keep the technology improving and we, we keep testing it. So 2025 will be a big year for us because we'll be starting the CODA, which is the transport hub, and also will become operation, operational for the Silverstone uh, project, which is a full-scale anti shade. And then on the top, this is where more we, we, uh, we um, deploy our, our technology abroad in, in other places. So first more of the, by doing pilot injection and then full scale operation. And we will need to be doing both DAC, their, their capture story, um, on-site capturing storage, but also those kind of a larger uh, hubs that, that will be quite key to, to reach the gigaton scale in, uh, by, uh, by 2030. So just to, to finish off, so when we work at Carpex is to a globally upscale CO2 mineral storage in Basel towards the gigaton scale. There are several pathways to do so, which is our the three parallel pathway I've, I've talked about. And as part of our kind of service, what we can do to help is we can offer consult consultancy to kind of share our experience in, in what we've learned uh, by doing it in Iceland since, uh, since about uh, um, 15 years ago. We also have IP licensing, and we're also kind of just currently developing offshore application and utilizing other geological formations. So we 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 have quite a few things that uh, that is uh, that that is uh, on the way. So it is it is uh, very exciting. And I just this is just the last slide. I just want to thank you all for for uh, listening uh, to uh, to my presentation. Hey, thanks so much, Thomas, for, for a really cool presentation. Um, I, I've seen a ton of questions flying in the chat, so people seem really engaged and interesting in this work. So um, thanks again. I mean, this is this is really, really cool stuff. I, I'm really glad that I was able to bring you guys in for a talk because this is just so different from anything else I've heard about in the in the CCS realm of space. So um, We'll go ahead and we'll get to the questions. Um, so Arnold was the first one with a question at, uh, at 9.13 a.m., so <laughs> pretty early on. Um, 
Arnold, did you want to unmute or do you want me to read your question for you? You can just read it. Okay. Uh, uh, Arnold, so sure. He, he asks, um, if you're occluding your pore space by mineralizing carbonates in the reservoir, how do you maintain injectivity? And do you have to move the injection point after a few years when you've turned all your pore space to rock or, or what's the time frame on that? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an excellent question. And, and actually, first, when we inject the CO2, we actually dissolve the rock. So we actually increase the injectivity of our injection wells because uh, we inject a, a weakly acidic solution. And at low pH, we're going to be dissolving the, the rock. And the mineralization happens a bit further away. So, so we, we, we don't really clog up the, the, the well. And we've been injecting since 2014. And we, yeah, there hasn't been any clogging of the well. And there's actually been a little bit of increase in injectivity. Um, when you're talking about more the megaton scale and injecting a lot more uh, CO2, then what will happen is that, yeah, you will kind of saturate the, the reservoir uh, with CO2. So you, you will kind of reach, you by one injection well, you have reached all the space that is accessible to that well. So then, yeah, you will need to, uh, to drill a new well every couple of years. Uh, but what we've seen currently is that, at least in Iceland, it will be very site-specific. Um, you could theoretically inject 100 times more CO2 in the wells that we're currently using without really seeing an impact. The, the space, the volume available in that reservoir is, is humongous. Okay, the next question, I, I think so, yeah. The next question uh, kind of went along uh, similar lines and uh, what sort of CO2 volume can you get, can you inject before you get to the injectivity issue? And I imagine that this has to deal with the porosity of the reservoir and everything, but. And, and how much volume you can access. Um, I think that there has been estimates uh, at, uh, in Iceland and the, the capacity is, is huge, uh, just with one single well. Um, I think in the reservoir where we're currently uh, injecting, the reservoir itself could potentially uh, store 300 megaton of, of CO2. The, the limit there will be more how much CO2 you can inject using one well, because you need to dissolve the CO2 in water. It means that you're not injecting pure CO2. So you, you, the injectivity will limit how much CO2 you can inject per injection well. So that, that's the main limiting factor. Not the reservoir, but more the, the injection well and the capacity of it. Great. Uh, I saw that SD had a, a, a couple of questions. SD, did you want to unmute and ask these questions or? Sure, I can unmute. I went crazy on the chat there a little bit with too many questions. But uh, I guess uh, one of my questions is at what pressure are you injecting? the CO2 and to what depth? Yep. So just generally speaking, we inject at depths between yeah, 350, 400 meters and 800 meters. And you kind of need to be at least 400 meters so that the, um, the reservoir pressure is higher than the partial pressure of CO2 because you want to keep the CO2 in solution. So we cannot inject uh, too shallow, otherwise the CO2 will just uh, just uh, going to the, the, the gas space. Um, so right now we're currently injecting in three different like locations in, in, in Iceland. And uh, at the power station, we have been reused, we've been, we've used a well that was already there. So there we're injecting at the depth between 800 meter and uh, two kilometers depth. So, so we can really work on a, on a large um, depth ratio. And we inject at the pressures of, so the wellhead pressure will be around like seven bar uh, for our operation at Hetty Shady, uh, but for another operation, we had 20 bar wellhead. So we were kind of, we were just kind of playing, playing with it as, as is needed, depending on the, on the characteristics. Essie, did you did you want to ask your um your other question as well? Oh, I have plenty, but uh, maybe somebody <laughs> else should go ahead. I mean, I'm I'm hoping to talk to you guys uh, hopefully next week, and and there I can like 
elaborate on my questions, but if somebody else wants to, you know, keep going and then if there's time at the end, I'll keep asking my questions. Thank you. Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, good plan. Uh, Siang Lee, uh, do you want to unmute to ask your question or? Yeah, um, so my question was about um, how much um, water uh, is needed to actually uh, to uh, for the injection of the one tons of the CO2 because the CO2 is dissolved into water. I was thinking about the uh, efficiency of um, or the, how much water is needed uh, yeah, for the yeah. dissolution of um, the CO2. So there's a way to optimize it, but it's usually 20 ton of water for one ton of CO2. So it is water intensive, uh, but that's how we kind of work around it is we're actually using water from the same reservoir. So we're kind of circulating the water and, uh, and, and basically, um, yeah, there, there's, you're kind of getting the water from the same reservoir. So overall, you're kind of almost a net, uh, a, a net, uh, uh, a net system, a closed loop system where the CO2 will mineralize between when you inject it and between you produce back the water to, to dissolve the, the CO2. All right, thank you. Uh, Shang was saying uh, he missed the first 10 minutes. Can you kindly repeat how you verify the CO2 is permanently mineralized? Does it require specific reservoir properties? Yep. Yeah, so we, we verify it by uh, usually just chemical monitoring uh, using tracers where you kind of co-inject the CO2 with those tracers and then you're able to uh, to uh, to calculate how much CO2 has been mineralized, and uh, you could do some some uh, some direct coring, but this is kind of like uh, looking for for a needle in, in a haystack. It's it's kind of the, the volume of, of the rock is so huge that this is a bit a bit more difficult. So we cannot rely on, on chemical uh, monitoring. Uh, we cannot rely on traditional. Um, monitoring techniques that is used in, in other CCS because we, we cannot rely on those um, physical or geophysical uh, monitoring tools because at least I think to, uh, to my knowledge today, there's no real way to, to follow uh, CO2 that is being dissolved in water. Uh, it's, it's, you cannot really see it on seismic. You can't really see it on, on other kind of techniques. So we cannot rely on, the, on chemical um, uh, monitoring. And does the does it require specific reservoir properties? Yeah, you need to be injecting into a mafic rock that has those uh, those cations. Uh, hey, hey, Tom, uh, this is Shane. Can you hear me? Yep. <clears throat> Can I ask some follow up questions? So, you mentioned earlier that you say you don't see much injectivity problem, but uh, if CO two is mineralized, it may from some uh, minerals and uh, clog the pore, pores and pore throats. So permeability and porosity may be changed and reduced. So any monitoring on that, and if it's it's is the pore is pl uh, cl uh, cl uh, uh, plugged, then it should uh, reduce the injectivity, right? Yeah, yeah, it it will it will uh, definitely um, reduce, but the. The, the area of, of the reservoir where mineralization will happen happens at a distance from, from the well. So it, it will have kind of time to, to, to spread. It, it's not something that happens immediately uh, as soon as you inject it. Uh, but yeah, we, we do expect when we're gonna be injecting a lot more CO2 that uh, eventually you will need to drill another uh, in, injection well to, to, to avoid that. And that uh, yeah, eventually the injectivity will will uh, will decrease as you clog the space around uh, er, er, around the well. Thank you. And going kind of along, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a couple questions here really quick, um, just because this this question was kind of in, in vain of, of Shang's question about monitoring. Uh, Sue Havorka wanted to know more about the monitoring strategy and how you know when the reactive capacity of the active flow path is exceeded, because this will occur before all the rock is reacted because of the preferential flow paths in geologic media. To, um, to read the question. So, so I work on the other, I work on some of the other kinds of storage, you know, and, and uh, both uh, 
uh, geologic storage is super critical and and uh, um, uh, storage in in uh, um, soils and and uh, woods are are subject to very stringent monitoring and a, a lot of people have said that this mineral that mineral trapping is wonderful because it makes solid rock and it, which is true um, you know you emphasize that point but but uh, the, the this um, this doesn't solve the the inverse question you know you you said you use tracers to show that all the all the um, cations are reacted out um, which is a pretty serious science question you know you're I think I think there's still a gap um, that that in a that that the um, dissolved CO2 could escape escape fail to react out it, as, especially as as the project matures and the flow paths become calcite you know uh, become uh, lined with calcite and less reactive um, how do you know when that's going to happen before it before it happens and your CO2 leaves and goes someplace it's not supposed to be. Yeah, um, that, that, that is a good question. Um, do you want to like start by saying, so unless um, the, since we dissolved the, the CO2 in water, there is already solubility trapping, which is already trapping. So the, the CO2 will still be in solution, will still be able to move, but it has no drive to move back up to the surface unless there's some natural upflow in the area, natural springs and things like that. And this is, all, of course, something that, that needs to, to happen. But yeah, the, the question, how, how do we know when we exceed yeah, the, uh, the, the, the capacity, the reactive capacity of the uh, active flow path? Um, I think that, yeah, it's using those kind of monitoring laws, monitoring laws yeah. when we see that there's... Well, Actually, we'd love, we'd, we'd love a chance to work with you on, on how, as you're, as you're talking about going to a big scale, you know how we could use the tricks we have for for other more reactive phases of CO two where, where monitoring is is perceived as more important and maybe we could transfer some some ideas to you about about how you provide multiple layers of assurance to that uh, because CO two can come out of solution it's pressure dependent right yeah yeah. As long as, yeah so so if you set, injecting it as pressure as it depressurizes CO two will come out you'll have free phase CO two. You're counting on it reacting out first. That's jolly, mm -hmm. uh, and, and but I think when you go to the gigatons, then it, then it becomes important to to uh, you know both but make it make a check that this is as advertised so that credits are worthy. Project can go forward full blast. Yeah, no, no, exactly, and we're kind of working towards that to kind of standardize the, the method because at the moment there's there's not because there hasn't been enough players. But on, on the monitoring, it is definitely something that will kind of be, uh, yeah, working uh, in the future. And uh, Thanks. yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, next question will be from uh, Tristan Childress, uh, or sorry, Con. Actually, uh, Con, I saw you uh, unmute there. My bad. Go ahead. Yeah, thank. You. Yeah, that was a great question, Susan. On that topic, I think it'd be interesting if you, you know, you had a shallow injector, it mineralizes, it's at capacity, injectivity drops off, and then you punch deeper and do a stacked, uh, stacked injection. So that way that interval that already has been mineralized can then be a seal to the secondary injection. Something exotic I was thinking about, but my question pertains to the nature of the water that is currently being used for your slurry injection. You said it was formation water. And so that kind of answered answered the question, but do you know, have any more information about that? Like maybe yeah. it's all solids or chemical composition? Uh, that, that is something I, I will be able to share. So at the, um, at the head city, so the water we're actually using is uh, condensate from the power station. That's the water we use to cap, to, to dissolve the CO2 in. So it's kind of almost pure water. And then we, um, since we're using a well that's also um, used for the uh, reinjection of the power station, it mixes with the uh, geothermal brine, which is cooled geothermal fluid. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a yeah, geothermal uh, fluid uh, for some said, of our, yeah. You said it's pretty much uh, distilled, so pretty pure? For, yeah, for, for the condensate. Uh, and then we mix it also with uh, just geothermal uh, fluid. 
that is uh, already injected in the uh, in the reservoir. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, ion deprived water, I think is um, supposed to be more favorable for that ion, ion exchange because because there's a, a need for ions in the fluid. So that's, that's very clever. Thank you. Okay, and now the question from Tristan. Tristan, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Or you want me to just ask it for you? Usually he shows up. Uh, okay, I'll ask it for him. Uh, Tristan asked, have you considered partnering with the mining industry to develop a technique to simultaneously leach economic minerals and replace them with carbonates? Uh, he said he's heard about this, but he hasn't seen much development. Uh, I haven't. I don't think we've uh, discussed this um, yet. It's maybe something we'll need to look at in the future, then we'll need to see what... Uh, what so how would that work? We're going to leach. You know, it depends if there's any benefits to uh, to um, to yeah to uh, some of those uh, elements that we won't be using for the uh, mineralization to be used by the mining. But that's not something I've, I've really heard or, or discussed about. Uh, I'm not going to be able to comment too much on that. So um, I'm going to jump in really quick, if you don't mind. Uh, so Thomas, yeah, that was something that I would like to discuss with you uh, hopefully next week. So the idea would be uh, to transform the rock into something a little softer and easier to mine, such as carbonate. And um, yeah, we can we can talk about it, but that's where all my questions are, are heading towards. So I'll be very happy to discuss it with you. Okay, looking forward to it. Okay, uh, we're getting towards the end of our question. Sorry to be putting you through the, the ringer, Thomas, a lot of questions for this talk. Uh, Sahar asks, uh, have you faced an injectivity issue with the carb fix project? Not at this stage, because uh, we're just, at least from what we, we know, just injecting a fraction of what the reservoir could take. We have not seen any injectivity issue. Okay, and Connor was, um, Potter was asking about the uh, the push to transport CO2 from around Europe to the reservoir offshore in Iceland and uh, is asking it would not be better to just inject local basalts co-located with um, CO2 sources in different European countries. Yeah, it, it definitely would. Uh, it's, it's the cheapest, more efficient way. I think it's easier for us to develop this kind of project in Iceland and we kind of need to provide, to show that it works. We, we need to start somewhere. So we're kind of... Uh, our kind of approach is to have those flagship project in Iceland just to show, all right, this is kind of proof of concept and it can be uh, deployed elsewhere. But uh, yeah, of course, and we're hoping that uh, the work that we're doing with Hetley Shady with the on-site capture um, or a hub, then will be, uh, will be copied and done uh, mainland Europe. We have done some small pre-feasibility work in Europe. There is definitely some interest. But it is also a different type of rocks that you know that there's different steps that needs to to be done. But yeah, it would definitely be uh, be the best uh, solution. Andras and uh, David have similar questions. Uh, Andras is asking, are you fracturing or planning to fracture the basalts to increase storage capacity? And David wants to know how connectivity is established if it's predominantly fractures or if it's a uh, pore space. Yeah. So uh, no, we're, we're not uh, fracturing. We're planning to fracture in the future. That's not something uh, we uh, really are planning to do in, in the near future. Then you know we'll see how 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 it uh, uh, where it leads us. Because I think for sure uh, lack of permeability and lack of porosity of interconnected porosity will become an issue in some of those older rocks. And this is something that we'll we'll need to to face when 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 we're there seeing what type of solutions uh, we, we can uh, come up with. But at the moment, we, we're not yeah, fracturing planning. And uh, currently, fracture pore space. And we have issue with high porosity, but low connectivity. Yeah, so it's, of course, um, we haven't had issue with, with kind of those high porosity, low connectivity um, yet. Uh, not in the rock type, but we've been uh, injecting. Um, yeah. Very good. Okay, we got two two more questions, and, and then we will release you to uh, to go home. <laughs> uh, 
the first question is from Belle. Uh, she was asking, was it difficult to get funding for this project? Um, was it? It's definitely had to, to jump a few few loops and to kind of uh, um, yeah, to kind of uh, convince people that this was a uh, this was uh, an option, a possibility. But this process has become easier and easier. Like I, I do remember that was before my time, before I got involved with Carface, but back in, in 2007, 2012, there was a lot of skepticism. So then it was quite a bit harder to, to get the funds, uh, funds for it. Now it's, people have kind of warmed up to, to that idea. There's still some, some um, criticism and some of them are definitely uh, accurate or, you know, it's, it's good to have a, a healthy um, exchange of ideas. Um, so yeah, it is always a bit of our, our difficulty for us uh, to, to get funding, but it is getting easier. Uh, right now, we at Carfix, we are still publicly owned. So currently, we cannot get um, funding from outside of uh, from outside uh, entities. And what how we circumvent that is for Coda. Then we kind of create a sub company that can get outside uh, investment. So right now, we kind of focus uh, rely on on research uh, funding. Uh, for to 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 friend yourself. Awesome. And the last question is from Ramon Trevino. Um, Ramon is asking if you generate static geologic and flow models, and if so, what software you use. Yeah. So we do both static and, and flow. For static, we use uh, mainly, or partners use mainly um, a software called Leapfrog because. This is a uh, leap frog is quite popular in the uh, geothermal uh, area, and this is where kind of carpets grew out of. Uh, I know there's many other type of, uh, of, um, of software that can be used. Um, and for the flow models, yeah, right now we are using a software that's been developed at Berkeley, tough. Uh, but again, there's a lot of uh, different uh, simulators that could potentially uh, uh, work. Okay, well, I think we have run ourselves out of questions and we are hitting our time limit and it is probably just about 5 p.m. for you, is that right? No, 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 about 4, 4 p.m.? 4 p.m., okay, it's, that was about an hour, okay. Well, if it was 5 p.m., I was gonna feel really, really bad, but 4 p.m. still bad enough on a Friday afternoon. So um, thank you again, Thomas, from all of us for agreeing to do this presentation and uh, please send Sandra our regards and, you know, this has been really great. And I know that this is inspiring a lot of new thoughts and, and new ideas in our in our heads. So um, I'll make sure to connect uh, you guys with Esty, who I know had, had requested a meeting with you guys. Um, and I, I look forward to hearing more from you guys and, and, and what you've all been doing in the future. It sounds like you've got a really uh, a bright pathway ahead with a lot of cool stuff. Thanks so much for, for having us. It was, it was great to, to be able to, to talk with you all today. All right, everybody. And just as a reminder, next week, Swapen Sahu will be presenting on his work in geochemistry and uh, advances in critical minerals. So please stay tuned then. Until then, bye.